You're listening to The Robin and Boom Show, the place where we engage the contemporary world with the great tradition. Wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, or elsewhere, you'll find us there. And now, here's today's co-host, Robin Phillips. Welcome back to The Robin and Boom Show. Jason Van Boom sends his regards. He is deep in thesis land working on his PhD thesis. So once again, I'll be hosting this podcast alone. So we want to talk about Plato today. Now, there's a side of Plato that is very Gnostic, Gnostic-like, if I could use the term without anachronism. And this is the side of Plato that um, many people are familiar with. He uh, refers to the body as a tomb. He talks about the soul being polluted through its substantiation in matter. Now, for a while, friends have been telling me, you know, Robin, there's this other side of Plato that you should explore, um, where his thought actually becomes a little more sophisticated. Um, But I was convinced that this wasn't the case. I was on such a crusade against what I call Gnosticism that it was hard to see anything else within Plato. Um, I'm reminded that when all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. And I was convinced that Plato hated the body and that his influence on Christianity had been negative. But one of the jobs that I do, I work as a janitor two days a week at a call center, and I'm able to listen to audio books and courses while I do my work. And one of the courses I was listening to was a course called The Great Minds, um, the, the Great Minds of the Western Intellectual Tradition, going through all of Western philosophy with top-notch professors. It's one of the great courses, and um, that's that's the name of the, of, of the um, the series, The Great Courses by the Teaching Company. And I was intrigued by uh, by lectures from Dr. Philip Carey. I kept coming. I kept uh, coming back to his lectures and finding them very intriguing. And Dr. Philip Carey has a lecture on Plato's psychology, where he shows that Plato's psychology becomes more complex as Plato matures. And what we actually end up with is something that becomes appropriated by Christian philosophers to actually help them grow closer to Jesus and actually um puts a positive value a positive qualified valuation on the material world and since understanding this i've been able to use plato to help me understand um issues of spiritual psychology that come up today in the modern world so i'm blessed to have dr philip carey with me today um dr philip is a professor of philosophy at eastern university in st david's pennsylvania where he is also scholar in residence at the Templeton Honors College. He has written numerous books, including three published by Oxford University Press. He has taught around the world about philosophy and theology from ancient to modern times. And I'm delighted to have a scholar of your caliber with us today. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for saying such nice things. Yes. Well, um, I'd like to just begin by asking you about Plato in his early period. You know, there there is this idea that the soul becomes polluted um, by um, its contact with material things. Tell us a bit about um, Plato's dualism in the um, some of the early dialogues. Right. Well, the most important early dialogue uh, uh, in this connection is called the Phaedo. Um, sometimes pronounced Fido, P-H-A-E-D-O. It's the dialogue set uh, on the last day of Socrates' life. And he and his friends or disciples or students, what do you call them exactly? They're talking about the immortality of the soul um, because, you know, Socrates is going to die. What does he expect after death? And in that dialogue, he's really quite dualistic. He does describe the body as an evil, as a prison. The soul needs to purify itself from bodily attachments as if the body is a kind of dirt. And if the soul can really purify itself, it will be 
free from the body, and the body, after all, is mortal, but the soul is immortal, and when it is purified, it will be free from the body forever and, and have, um, well, live in a land of, of immortality with the eternal forms of things. So that's a very dualistic vision, and that's the, the side of Plato that gets picked up by the Gnostics. Uh, Plato's not a Gnostic, but many of the Gnostics were uh, one form of Platonist or another, a, a dualist form of Platonism, which catches only one side of Plato's thinking. Yeah, and that actually leads into what I want to do actually about next, which is the the evolution of his thought as as he he matures, and perhaps this might be a good um, point to say something about um, his relation to both Socrates and Aristotle, because as I understand, Aristotle may have been central in his development. Very likely. Yes, Plato is one of the group of young men who hung around Socrates and learned from Socrates and probably learned something about the art of inquiry, of seeking for the true and lasting form of things rather than merely being satisfied with the appearances of things like, oh, so-and-so has a reputation for wisdom. But Socrates wants to ask him some questions and find out if he's truly wise. And so the whole Socratic movement is, is toward finding what wisdom and truth and beauty and virtue really are, and not just what they appear to be. Um, so Plato wants to, to get these essential forms of things which are not bodily things. They're, you can see images of them or imitations of them in the world of the senses. You can see someone who's you know maybe wise but isn't wisdom personified. Plato wants to find wisdom itself, which he thinks is not going to be something you see with your eyes. You're going to see it with your mind. And that's going to be separated from bodily things. So that's that, that kind of move away from the body. But then he founds the school called the Academy. And at one point, one of the young students who joins the Academy is an 18-year-old named Aristotle, who is the smartest guy in town. And, and Plato learned to respect questions and critical discussion. So what is he going to do with this highly intelligent and very critical young man? He's going to listen, and, and they're going to have, it turns out, probably 20 years of conversations. Uh, Aristotle was a member of, of Plato's school, the academy, for 20 years, became his teaching assistant. Aristotle wrote some of his early works while he was teaching in Plato's academy, and he must have influenced Plato's thought. And what we can trace, or what lo lots of scholars think we can trace, uh, it's hard to date Plato's works, but on the usual dating of Plato's works, the Plato becomes more and more sophisticated about the way bodies can reflect the, the true forms of things. Because Aristotle's pushing him to say, look, don't you find the forms of things by looking at the things themselves? And the difference really is, is Plato's thinking almost like a mathematician. In fact, he loves math. And you know the true triangle that a mathematician's talking about is not a bodily thing because you're not learning about it by measuring it with, with rulers or something. It's, it's entirely separated from bodies. Aristotle is thinking less like a mathematician and more like, um, like a biologist. And if you want to know the true form of a horse, you're going to have to look at a bunch of horses. Yes, and, and uh, his father was actually a physician who studied animals, if I remember correctly. His father was a physician, so Aristotle's thinking about how bodies are put together. Aristotle has a, a, a fascinating little defense of, um, of dissections, uh, dissecting you know dead animals. Um, most B Greek philosophers would say, yuck, we don't do that kind of thing. We contemplate eternal truths. But Aristotle says, well, if you want to know what the truth about a horse is, you might have to di dissect a horse. You, know, well, you have to be like a butcher, for heaven's sakes. Uh, philosophers have to do that, maybe. So... That conversation goes on, and, and Aristotle is basically bringing these eternal forms of things down to earth and saying, you can, you can see them in the forms of things. That influences Plato, I think, because although he never quite sees the eternal forms of things embodied in matter the way that Aristotle does, he does think, gee, we can see at least an image of the truth in things. So... We want to know what eternal justice is, what, the, what you know, the, the eternal truth about justice is. Maybe we can see some of it in a just society, or at least 
uh, try to construct what a just society would look like if we saw it you know, with our own eyes and actually lived in such a place? How would it reflect true and eternal justice? And that's kind of the project of his great uh, work, The Republic. Uh, there are images of the eternal truth that we can, well, see with our eyes. Yes, and <clears throat> so, so, so this this sort of mod modulation in his thought under Aristotle's influence, as Aristotle helps to kind of bring him down to earth, if you will. How does how does that play out in his ongoing development of uh, spiritual psychology? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, part of it is that um, his psychology ends up uh, dividing the soul into three parts. Um, in the Phaedo, that early work, which was so dualistic and, and inspired the Gnostics, there's, there's really only the pure soul or the impure soul. And the impure soul is the soul that's attached to bodily things. In, um, in the Republic, you get this three-part soul. And there's still problems of being too attached to bodily things and driven by um, uh, bodily desires. But there's also a part of the soul that he calls the spirited part. He is, uh, the Greek word is thumos. It, it's not a, a matter of spirituality so much as uh, the part of uh, the part of it is like a spirited horse or a spirited warrior who's fighting for the right thing. There's a part of your soul that says, I'm going to fight these bad desires. I'm going to be um, a good warrior. I'm going to be a good citizen. Um, this will take a little work, but I'm going to behave myself so that I can be contributing to the common good as a soldier or a farmer or a husband um, and, and a father. And that way um, we can make the justice that my intellect catches a glimpse of in a kind of heaven of eternal forms and we can make the earth look a little bit more like this heaven of eternal forms. We can bring justice down to earth, at least to some extent. Um, so what were the three parts of the, of, of the person in this later development? Right, the spirited part is in the middle. Plato compares it uh, to, a, to a, a dog that, that's good at obeying its master. Right? So the dog doesn't have rationality in and of himself, but he can obey the reason in his master. So, so the higher part of the soul, the highest part of the soul is essentially our intellect, which is like the eye of the mind that sees the eternal truth of things. It's what happens when you see a mathematical truth and say, aha, I see it. But Plato's interested especially in how we might see virtue and, and wisdom and, and see the, the forms of justice that we need to, to try to enact on earth. So that's the highest part of the soul. We could call it intellect. Then there's this middle part of the soul, the spirited or thumos part of the soul, which is like a, 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 an intelligent dog or a horse that listens to reason and can do what um, a reasonable person uh, commands it to do. And then there's the lower part of the soul. You could think of it as um, the gut. So you can think of it as head, heart, and gut. Um, when C.S. Lewis writes about men without chest, the chests are the, the, the thumatic part, this part of the spirited part. Um, so the, the gut is where we eat, where we reproduce, where we sleep, where we lust. Um, if things go well, we can discipline our gut so that we eat in ways that are healthy rather than gluttonous. Um, we can, um, and we, we can go govern our bodily desires so they serve higher purposes. And that's another way of bringing virtue down to earth is we want to say, look, the, the lower part of ourselves is not simply wicked. It's going to have to be disciplined. We're going to have to, you know, drink in moderation, eat in moderation, um, procreate in moderation, all that stuff. And it can be done. And this is what Aristotle is going to pick up when he talks about uh, virtue, which affects the form, not just of how we think, but of how we live, how we eat, how we sleep, and all of our actions. Yes. And um, I'm actually hoping next week to talk to you about uh, virtue and its Aristotelian context. Um, but again, so with Plato, then let's move forward to a work like the Symposium, where there is a, a, a there is a valuation um, and a dignity placed on the material body in a qualified sense. So w w we we fall in love with somebody's body, but then we can ascend 
from love of body to love of soul, and then from love of soul to love of city, and then from love of city to love of heavenly things. So, so material realities start to become portals or icons of transcendent realities. And this is really the point that gets picked up on by Christian philosophy. But uh, I'm getting a little ha- ahead of myself. Tell me about tell me about this this um, this final stage in Plato's development where the body becomes an icon. Well, not just the body, but but material things in general can become portals of transcendent realities. Right. Um, think of of three different texts in Plato, all of which are really important classic texts for Western philosophy. Um, the, the one that you're talking about is in the symposium, but let me back up just a little bit to the Republic again. In the Republic, there's this famous allegory of the cave where um, it looks like the, the world of the body, the world of, of physical things is like a dark cave where we're just looking at shadows of things and we want to climb up out of the cave and into the light. And it looks like it's, you know, it's fleeing the body and going into a world of, of pure essential forms and ideas. Um, and we want to escape these, these shadows. But shadows are interestingly ambiguous. Um, shadows don't have any substance of their own. Uh, they're not the real things of which they are shadows. But they do have a form. They have a shape that resembles the thing that casts the shadows. So even the shadows have a kind of form that might remind you of the the true thing that you're seeking. So even shadows are a kind of image that go two ways. They might look like they're nothing, empty, unreal, and yet they point to something more real than themselves. Um, Let's save the symposium for last. Let me go go to another text, the Phaedrus. It looks like Phaedo, but with an R-U-S at the end. So it starts out the same way. The the, the title goes uh, P-H-A-E-D. R-U-S, the Phaedrus. This also is a dialogue about love, about eros. And what happens in in the Phaedrus, among other things, um, Plato gives an account or um, uh, an an explanation of why we fall in love. What is it that happens when we see a beautiful human body and it makes us gaga with love, right? We we just, we're we're knocked head over heels. We we go crazy. It's a form of, of madness. What's going on? And Plato says, we're being reminded of a true and eternal beauty that our souls saw before we were born. Uh, Because because Plato's thinking that our souls existed before our birth. And before we came into our bodies, we we, we were contemplating divine and eternal beauty. And now that we're in our bodies, we see another human body and we say, oh, that reminds me of something. Oh, I want that. That's, That's Eros looking at a body and saying, it reminds me of something that's even better than this beautiful human body. The problem is, of course, we sometimes get so into the beautiful human body that we forget everything else. And that leads us to the third uh, text, the one that you mentioned, the symposium, where there's a kind of ladder, uh, a ladder of beauty and love and eros, right? E-R-O-S, that, that erotic love, which starts with uh, beautiful human bodies and then goes to the beauty of... Um, of beautiful souls when we are attracted by a wise and virtuous person, and then to the beauty of uh, a well-ordered city, the, 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 uh, a city where, where there's justice and the common good is pursued, and finally to the eternal justice and beauty, which is what sort of originally stirred up our love and erotic desire. And all of these things are good. Some are better than others. It it is a ladder, and the things at the top of the ladder are better. But nothing on the ladder is evil. Human bodies are good. They're not the best good. They're not the ultimate thing to love. But they're not a bad place to start. Uh, If you don't have that erotic desire, you're not going to have the desire for the higher and and holier and more divine things either. Beautiful, yes. I find it fascinating how Plato... um appropriated the method of his teacher Socrates of always searching for truth, always questioning, and how this um, method of truth-seeking led him to this more sophisticated view of the body and soul that we find in these later dialogues. Um, Well, as as a matter of fact, I think he has to think about the motivation for this Socratic truth 
seeking. In the Republic, where, where they have this allegory of the cave, he pictures you being dragged up out of the cave and into the light. But that's not quite right. When we're seeking the truth, one of the things that happens is that desire gets kindled. We, we long to know the truth. And that longing is an erotic desire. It's a form of eros, Plato's thinking. It's not just that we're being dragged by you know, someone forcing us to learn something. We want to know the truth. We are in love with truth. And that's essential to who we are as rational beings. Wonderful, beautiful. Um, okay, so so this this idea of a ladder of ascending from material things to transcendent realities, this gets this is picked up on um, by Christian philosophy and becomes becomes um, central to the thought of of. Um, uh, Augustine and other Christian thinkers who put a positive valuation on the things of this world, but only insofar as the things of this world are icons or portals to higher realities. T tell us a, a, a bit about um, Christian Neoplatonism. Okay, yes, right. So Augustine is a great Christian Platonist. Um, he is enormously influential in the West. In the Eastern Christian tradition, you've got a Christian Platonist um, that scholars call pseudo-Dionysus, or, or I'll just call him Dionysus. He can also be called Dennis. Uh, he's, he's called Saint Dennis in the West because he, he influenced the West. Um, the Dionysian tradition was very big on icons. Um, icon is just actually the, the Greek word for image. So icons have that double-sidedness. They're not the thing that they're an icon of, but they open up a, as like a portal saying, this is what it looks like. It's like this. It's not right. So you have a, a, an icon of Christ. This is not Christ. It's a piece of wood. But Christ is like this, just like your image in a mirror is like you. It's not you, but it tells you something about you. And you might learn something about you by looking at the image. So that becomes central to Eastern Orthodox um, spirituality. Um, Augustine will tend to speak in terms of signs, um, and, and that feed, feeds into the notion of a sacrament. Um, he will tend to think of the created world as saying, oh, yes, this is beautiful, but you, th this is not really what you're looking for. It's not me you're looking for, but, but the one who made me. So Augustine will, in, in Book 10 of the Confessions, will say, I was asking the creation for what I was looking for. And the creation answered with its beauty and said, I'm not what you're looking for. I'm like this. I'm like what you're looking for, but, but you're looking for the one who created me. So at the center point of the whole confessions in book 10, he has this moment where he, he prays to God and says, oh, late have I loved you. Oh, beauty, so ancient and so new. Late have I loved you. And I kept looking for you in, in uh, external things. And their beauty was real. Right? Augustine makes no, no question about this. The things God made are all beautiful and they're all real and they're all good. Everything he makes is good, but none of them is the ultimate good we're seeking. So each one of these beautiful and good things is trying to say, yes, what you really want, however, is not me, but the one who made me. So look higher, look a little bit more inward. Um, so Augustine never thinks that the, the, the physical world is evil. And he learned that, he says, from reading books of the Platonists. He learned from reading uh, Neoplatonists, especially, especially Plotinus, that everything that, that is, everything that exists is good because it all comes from the supreme good. But the lower goods are not the goods that are going to make us eternally happy. So we need to, to get on that ladder, the ladder of the symposium, and, and climb up to where the true good is. Yeah. Yeah. So on one of the um, missions of this podcast is to take the big ideas of the great tradition and apply them to the issues we face in the modern world. Um, and so let's let's just wrap up by doing that now, because in in the modern world today, we are constantly bombarded with the idea that what we see around us is all there is. All we need for happiness is what can be provided for us in the mall, in the glossy magazines, the adverts, the, the, the areas. Um, in so many different ways, we are conditioned 
to think that true goodness, true beauty, true happiness can be found in the imminent. And so how do, how can a contemporary appropriation of Neoplatonism help help us to recapture that transcendent horizon that the beautiful things of Earth are pointing us towards? Right. So if you're going to think about um, sort of a, a Platonist approach to contemporary culture, you're going to have to start probably with the notion of desire, uh, because consumer society is all about desire, but it's all about training you to desire what consumer society can provide, which means keeping you at the lowest level of that ladder. Um, a, a neo-Platonist or Platonist um, ascasis, uh, training, asceticism, will say, these are beautiful things, but they're not the thing we're made for. They're not the thing that we most deeply want. Our erotic desire is leading us to something that we're not just going to be able to buy at the mall. Um, these are all pointing beyond. And the question is, how do you, what road do you have to what these things are pointing to? Because, um, there are some beautiful things in the mall. You can buy beautiful art. You can buy good wine. You can buy food that is that would well that would be so luxurious that it would be only fit for a king in the ancient world. Um, and these can, you can make your life out of these things, and that would be a life that is not well spent. So what happens when you recognize, say, hmm, the beauty of another person and the beauty of their lives, the beauty of how they live, the beauty of their soul is is what a Platonist would say. And again, there's consumer ways of consumerist ways of doing that, you know, movies and TV shows that basically turn other people into forms of satisfaction that I can enjoy. But a Platonist meditation would say, what I enjoy about this this person that, that I, I love because of, of what you know they, they're a hero in a in a war movie, I love this man's courage. And I want to have a share of that. I want to share some of the same courage that person has. Um, and that's going to be more than what a movie is going to give me. And it's going to have to lead me to train my own soul in courage and temperance and, and a reshaping of desire for things that are better than what I can see on TV. Because it's got to be part of my life and not just what I watch on a screen. I love it. I love it because this is what philosophy is really about. Philosophy is about um, becoming better people, people, um, and by that I mean flourishing people, um, <clears throat> ultimate. Yeah, Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato would all agree about that, no question. And that actually leads into what we want to talk about next week. Uh, Dr. Philip Carey will be a guest on our podcast again, where we will actually be talking about virtue, and you will learn why postmodernism is not entirely bad. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. The Robin and Boom Show is made possible through the generous support of listeners like you. To become a patron of the show, go to robinmarkphillips.com and select The Robin Boom Show from the drop-down menu. If you have questions you'd like to have addressed on a future episode, send us a message through our Facebook page. Once again, thanks for listening.